to What's in the Box, Episodes of Horror with Donna and Eric. I'm Donna. And I'm Eric. And we're on to the next movie in our series of horror movies that shaped our youth love of horror. Um, tonight is my pick. Um, and I am, we are going to be talking about Cat People, 1982. Um, and I got to okay. say, this is definitely you. Yeah. <laughs> the 100% now. Um, <laughs> It was popular, and I remember it being on TMC all the time. Yeah, but um, I'm not 100 percent sure I'd have actually ever seen it all the way through until this time. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't know the story, um, so basically, Irina Natasha Kinsky, she goes to meet her estranged brother Paul in New Orleans, and weird stuff starts happening, and Paul disappears, and um. Basically, she finds out she's like this leopard person, um, hence cat people. So that's, it's kind of cool. Um, based off of a movie from the twenties, I think nineteen forty-two is it forties. So there's yeah. a, so that movie is not going to be anything like this, other than maybe they turn into cats. Yeah. Um, but so I was actually kind of curious, um, and I looked so. It's based on the 1942 um, Cat People, which is kind of a similar storyline. Um, the people turn into leopards when they get aroused. Aroused. Okay. Yeah. That's that's something for the 40s. Yeah. And that movie was actually based off of a short story by Algernon Blackwood that was written in 1906 called Ancient Sorceries. Hmm. So well, we should have read that. Yeah. So it's funny because I, I found it on Amazon. Um, I got the ebook and it's like 62 pages. I think it's like a collection of his stories. Um, so I'm like, I'll read it eventually because every time I see a movie from the 80s, I automatically I'm starting to think now, what book is this based on? Was this based on a book? You know, <laughs> so because I do have the novelization of Cat People. I just haven't read it yet. OK. Those are always fun. Yeah. Because every once in a while, they'll slip some extra stuff that's not in the movie, or they'll have stuff that they were told. Um, what happened to my picture here? That they were told to, uh, you know, add to it some subtext or whatever, things that didn't make it into the film that maybe was in the script, things like that. But it's always fun to, to grab one of those novelizations and see if there's yeah. something that maybe, um, you know, that you didn't pick up. Yeah, subtext gonna... wise or whatever it's a good movie i yeah. i did not i don't have a problem with the movie at all I, at the time when it came out i mean it's just it's um yeah we go. i mean honestly honestly it's more erotica than it is horror yeah and i remember the way they they advertised for it and it didn't really catch the attention of an eight-year-old me so this movie came out in 82, I think. Yeah. So I would have been seven, eight when it was on TMC, but I did catch many, many parts of this movie. Yeah. I'm just flipping through channels. I do remember it. And of course it's got some, you know, it's got some risque parts that mm -hmm. um, a young person of that age would probably be um, interested in sticking around for, but I didn't, I wouldn't have picked up on a lot of the subtext that yeah. was going on. Now, when you watch, um, you know, you look at the stuff now, Let's see. I want to get his name right. Paul Schrader's the writer director, and this guy is um, always forward with sex and sexuality and sexual situations and almost everything he does. Yeah, um, he's the guy that did American Gigolo. What else did he do? He yeah. did uh, Taxi Driver. He wrote Taxi Driver, so he's written a whole bunch of cool screenplays. Then he gets greenlit to write and direct. I want to say Cat People is one of the earlier works he did. Um, I think right after American Gigolo, which was a yeah. big hit the year before in 81. So, um, but yeah, no, there was a time when um, stars had this really cool series called directors and it would be a hour to an hour and a half. And they would focus on one director and they would basically go through his entire filmography and they oh, would, wow. and he would talk about why he did what he did or she did what she does. And um, you know, of course they have all the heavy hitters, Scorsese and uh, Coppola and all that. And, and, but I remember an episode with this guy 
And he was of the same era as uh, Lucas and uh, Scorsese, you know, that group of up and coming mm. directors. But he is, I want to say he's less of a filmmaker at heart, as in, you know, he wasn't, it wasn't one of these guerrilla filmmaker kind of guys. I think he went to school for something else and then kind of got bit later. And so this wasn't like his initial passion. Um, and then he kind of fell into making movies and stuff like that. Yeah. So he's got a different, a whole different um, eye for it. You know, the way he directs, the way he, he, he comes at the stories a little different than the people, his contemporaries, um, the way he films it, it, it has a different vibe to it. It does. It definitely doesn't feel like anything any of the other guys are doing. It almost has a fi- uh, a foreign film flair to it, you know. Yeah, it definitely yeah. feels like he also um, casts a lot of foreign actors. Yeah, who um, would be more would be more comfortable with all the nudity? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was definitely uh, an eighties movie with full on female nudity. Of course, no male nudity. Um, and Wikipedia does have it classified as erotic horror. Yeah, I was going to say, there is a spot or two where I'm sure uh, if you were really interested, you could have paused it and and checked out, um, you know, uh, McDonald's, uh, McDowell's stuff, you know, when he's on the floor getting up and stuff. There were some odd angles that the director decided to try, and you could see he was trying to kind of keep himself undercover. But this also is a movie that Malcolm um, McDowell would have done. You know, this fits perfectly into Caligula and clockwork orange and all those kind of just off of center movie that leans into um, kind of the weird sexual energy that you had at the end of that decade going into the early eighties. Yeah. I can't remember when I first saw this movie. Um, The only thing I can remember is the First thing that I think of when I think of this movie is the scene where the leopard Paul is in that little room after he had gone to see the prostitute after he attacked the prostitute and just the cat like, you know, they're climbing up the outside to shoot him with a dart to tranquilize Mm -hmm. him and he like goes like completely bonkers um, and running around the room and that's what. I think that's what drew me to this movie is because I was big on big cats when I was young. Oh yeah. The, the you know, the Panthers beautiful. Yeah. Lions and tigers and, and cheetahs and leopards. And, you know, that yeah. was my jam. You know, <laughs> I remember well, that in- thing. It must be an April thing. Cause I was a big fan too. Yeah. Of, when, of um, the big cats, when I was in like sixth grade, um, we lived in Kentucky and my mom worked, uh, worked at a Kmart which had a pet store next to it and some in the summer sometimes I would go to work with her and just like hang out all over the place you know back then you could loiter in stores and they really didn't care you know Um, but I would go to the pet store and the pet store had a lion cub oh that's cool I was going to say, is this story going to take us to something cool like that? Yeah. Yeah. I begged my mother to buy this lion cub. I remember crying and saying, it's only $1,500. You can write a check, you know, because I didn't know how checks worked. Like, I didn't know you had to have the money in the bank, you know. (laughs) But yeah, I'll never forget that. They had a a freaking lion cub at this pet store. I'm trying to, I'm thinking of that at that time. $1,500 Fifteen hundred dollars was pretty pretty high. Yeah, but I, I mean, it is a lion. But it feels like now you can get a lion for pretty cheap, probably. <laughs> and so I'm like, it doesn't feel like it matches the inflation of yeah. uh, the thing. But I'm like, yeah, yeah fifteen hundred for a lion. I think I'd sit there and think about it for a little bit. Yeah, uh, that would have been. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I remember one time getting uh, an opportunity. Don and I went to the movies with some friends right after we got married and for some reason they were trying to raise money for a wildlife um, rescue and they had cubs and you paid whatever 25 30 bucks or whatever and they would let you hold the cub and take a picture with it so i've got a picture of me holding the lion or tiger cub and yeah no that was really cool but to be at a pet store i mean that had been awesome yeah to be that close to it did they let contact or was it no it was like 
I don't know if I haven't been in a pet store in forever, but it was like behind a glass wall. Yeah. And then yeah, they I had like those. the cages on the walls and it was in yeah. like a, a, a double cage and it was like walking back and forth. That's insane though. That that's just in a pet store. Yeah. I mean, you feel like that would be something you would need a special license just to buy, let alone. You sell. would think so. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, it reminds me when uh, Luca got drafted by the Mavericks a couple years ago, uh, which is probably like seven or eight years ago now because the time d- doesn't seem to be fluid anymore. But um, the first thing they asked him, he was, what are you going to do with the money? And he said he was going to buy a lion because <laughs> he could do it in Texas. Yeah. So uh, I always thought that was a funny answer, too. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think it would be cool that the Panther is beautiful in this movie. This oh, movie, yeah. it's, a, it's a really good story. There's a couple moments where you're like, this is kind of extra awkwardly done you know, with the sex and stuff. And some of the story, some of it's a little off, you know, like it doesn't make a, a, a lick of sense, but yeah. overall it's a, it's a well done movie and you can, it's just, it's an eighties movie. It's a perfect eighties movie. I mean, it really reflects just about everything. Yeah. And then and it, I think that's more of a reflection of the, the writer director because I mean, that's what he leaned into. All of his movies have this kind of same blueprint. But uh, I mean, he's been doing it for a long time for a reason. Yeah, yeah, he has got to be one of the top um, writers uh, that that incorporate as much erotica as they do without it becoming, you know, porny, I guess. Right. Yeah. The opening is pretty fun, too, where they have you kind of hear almost like a cat like. Mm -hmm attack and then like the the letters for cat people the the logo kind of just like comes on the screen i thought that was pretty cool that was something i did like about this movie is it it's obviously about people that that transform into these animals so they could have done two two way they could have leaned into it and done a howling where we see a whole bunch of transformation and i think it would have ruined this movie Mm -hmm. but they did it more uh, the way they they did with cutscenes and stuff uh, they have a limited amount of special effects that show the transformation, and it's just um, jazzy enough where they're they're not showing us enough for us. We fill in the blank so it doesn't look as bad as it could. So yeah. I thought they, they handled it really well. I thought uh, you almost get the the feeling that he doesn't want anything really to do with the horror side of it. He's looking at this more as a tragic story about this girl and a love story. And then he's incorporated all of these taboos um, throughout the the thing. And I, and I can't tell if he's incorporating them because he's into it or because he just knows that it, it makes the story that much more, um, I want to say heartbreaking for the main character. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's an, it's a well shot and it's got a lot of um, good um, set pieces you know, because it's filmed in in uh, New Orleans and I guess out in the bayou, it feels like you know. The majority yeah, and the of opening, the opening scene is um, supposed to be Africa, I guess. Yeah, and it's and this he, tribe, yeah. and they sacrifice um, women to the to the leopards. And it's funny because I I just read a book not too long ago called uh, Black Cat by John Russo. Uh huh. And it's about a tribe of leopard people in Africa. Well, I want to say that's a that's one of the myths, you know. That yeah, they and and it's like a true myth in yeah. Africa that there's these people who believe that they can transform into leopards. So I was like, that's cool that I just read this book by yeah. a completely and, different person. That's kind of the fu- same myth. And it's funny because it's basically the Skinwalker myth. You yeah. know, it's so funny to see these different continents with the same myths just twisted the little this way a little that way but every population seems to have a shape-shifting um mythology so that almost makes you wonder because you know how they always say myths are based on some truths so then it makes you wonder if everybody's got a myth to this what are we you know what what's out there that we haven't seen or talked about you know which is kind of fun those are always fun and interesting to deep dive into black cat that book I was talking about was actually published in February of 1982. Oh, okay. So and it's then an older this, one. yeah, and this came out in April of 1982. Oh, I bet you he was kicking himself too because he's like, yeah. oh, they'll they'll make a movie of it, and then all of a sudden it comes out, and it's something else, and they're like, ah, oh, well, yeah, so. well, but, bummer for you, guy. <laughs> um, but it was so a completely the, different storyline. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was but, still, it, it was really cool. So it's like a uh, deep impact in uh, Armageddon, you know, just everything. They always seem to come out at the same time, even though they're a little different, but they're the same kind of general idea. Yeah. Oh, which way did that go? There we go. So um, I thought the cast was amazing. There's so absolutely. many amazing before they're famous actors mixed in with some pretty big heavy hitters. Yeah, I was like, well, every time somebody new came on the screen, I was like, holy crap, that's this guy or that's this, you know? Yeah, and I was like, man, um, they they just it, he must have had a American Gigolo must have done so well that this guy could get whoever he wanted because it mm-hmm. seems like he got. And, but again, we say that I'm saying that and at the same time thinking, okay, wait, these might be early films for these other people. And they were just happy to be on a film, but it's, I mean, some of the small parts are big actors now. So, yeah. Yeah. So we have uh Ruby D played for Molly. Uh, okay. Natasha. So I'd say when I'm looking it up, it just said female. I'm like, yeah. what is that? And I totally forgot her name was Bamale. So yeah. I was like, okay, female, whatever. Yeah. And then we'll go. And it's funny. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard this joke before, but it's a joke that um a woman was in a coma and she gave birth to a baby boy, a baby girl, and the the brother who wasn't very bright named the girl and Famali because that was what was written on the bassinet at the hospital they said female and she basically told kind of the same story of how she got her name which shows you how uh, well we had a uh, we had an incident last night as i was starting the movie the girls and uh, uh the possum they they had yeah. to come come to jesus meeting and so i had to stop what i was doing and go out there and separate them and clean up the dogs and stuff so um that might have put a damper on me paying attention to her story because it was right at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, but they are circus folk. Yeah. And their parents die and Irene is sent to another family. Now, I wonder why Paul wasn't. Yeah. So it's kind of confusing because is was Irina because it they make it seem like she was sent out of the country. Yeah, I got the vibe that she was sent overseas. Yeah. So that made me think that maybe the circus was a European circus. Yeah. But they don't so, specify. And they don't really specify if she was sent to family. She just went to no, another. There was one one time when she's telling a story. Doesn't she say the first family I was sent to? Which makes it sound like she, she jumped to a couple families yeah. before. So I think it was just a family. Like a foster care kind of situation. But yeah. then again, why wasn't Paul? Because they're not, it doesn't feel like they're that separate age wise. It felt and like our, they were closer. So, yeah. So, and another thing is, is Paul even really her brother? Yeah. I, I got that. I got that just from the, um, the brother and sisters have to mate. Yeah. So, it, like, so. So the whole thing, if you've never seen the movie, is Paul is supposedly Irina's brother, and they're supposed to mate together because if they don't, they turn into a leopard, and if they don't kill a human, they don't turn back to human. Yeah, that's, so, that right there is the oddest yeah. <laughs> plot point. And then really, yeah. I mean, you could really solve this is is just don't mate, and then you don't have to worry about becoming the leopard because that's the only thing doing it. So yeah. then they're – obviously, they're – so horn dogged up that they can't resist the urge to mate. Yeah. So that they've got to find the other leopard. But these apparently are the last two of their kind, which yeah. I also and, thought was kind of weird. But yeah. And he says they're, which they're not because the woman in the. Right. She's she where calls they're in the sister. bar. She says, my sister. So I was like, why don't they just find her again? Yeah. And then so use her as the thing. But, yeah. So he said, like, Later on in the movie, Paul comes to her, I guess, in a dream or something and explains um, that they're an incestuous tribe. But I don't think that necessarily means like brother, brother, sister, sister, you know. I got the vibe that it meant brothers like, and sister. Like yeah, I think. Incest, which I yeah, thought was one of the things that he was writing about the writer. Yeah, was but I think I think it more um, meant like within their tribe so the whole tribe is yeah like the whole tribe is related so it's not necessarily they have to necessarily be brother and sister but they really can only mate with their own kind 
which makes sense in that case, yeah. but you shouldn't say brother and sister at that point, right? Yeah. You should separate it. Now, as soon as they found out that he was going around killing people as a panther, which they didn't know he was a panther, so I guess just uh, they thought he was a serial killer. Yeah. Um, she's like, oh, that can't be my brother. We're, he's obviously not my brother. So, I mean, you, you know, that, that gives you a little wiggle room there, but the, the way that they, every time that he approached any of the sexual stuff with her, he was always saying brother, sister, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just a weird storyline that, that, you know, you have sex with a human, you turn into the leopard, you kill everybody, and then you turn back. Um, it just is like the weirdest. Yeah. <laughs> plot. Um, line. But I, without it, you don't have the story. So, I mean, I, I mean, it comes into that play, but uh, it, like I said, it just feels like you would just not have sex and you'd be okay. So if you had sex with yourself, would you turn into a leopard? Right. Or, no, or is it because you're also the creature, part of the family? Does that mean it's okay? Yeah. So that, there's a question they didn't they didn't explore. I'm yeah, waiting for he, the sequel so we can find that out. Yeah, right. He did a great job of playing a creep. Oh, God, he, good Lord. He, he was amazing. He made he you was, uncomfortable all the time. Yes. So he uncomfortable. Lingered, lingered touching her. Um, uh, the way he looked at her, the way he just um like he would he would he would just touch her in the oddest ways that that yeah was being subtle, but at the same time was blaringly obvious, so you immediately caught it. And even so, in the very beginning when she was at the airport, like the beginning yeah, the way he followed her, they followed her and then like kind of like stalked up to her while she was, yeah. you know, picking like up the a phone. Cat. Yeah. So I mean I get what he's doing. They're they're setting the groundwork, but at the time we don't know this. We just think he's a creepy guy. Yeah. But then we're also led to believe that they're family, brother and sister, and and being reunited. And then and then you watch him around her and you're getting these heavy it, sexual vibes. Yeah, like, like, like yeah. where is this t- where what is going on here? What are we <laughs> about to what are they gonna put us through? And so um what's funny though is that that she didn't pick up on it, not initially. You know, she was, she didn't seem, she just was happy to be there. It felt like she was very innocent. And that's one of the things I had a problem with in this movie is the complete change in Irina. Yeah. Which I guess that's the, is that the point with the boyfriend? Maybe. Um, I think it's the, but she goes from this timid, demure, little Mm -hmm. naive woman and turns into this like weird, crazy, like sex cat. Like, you know, I guess maybe she's in heat, if that's the... <laughs> Which is what the brother says at one point. He can smell everything going on and that she's yeah. all, you know, randied up for the boyfriend. And Yeah. And But she's already told the other girl that she hasn't had an opportunity. She's never had sex. She's never um, even really fooled, uh, fooled around a little bit, but not enough because she was too anxious about the whole situation. She didn't even know that she was going to turn into a leopard. And yeah. She was, you know, worried about it and stuff. And so... And it's funny though to, to watch that and then compare it to something today, just how naive she comes across when you think of somebody the same age in a picture today, the way they try and make everybody so mature and stuff in that in that aspect. It's it was uh but yeah, you're right. It's like a flip of a switch on her. And so I think you're right. Uh, on that case too, is that it's it's she's in heat. Yeah, and, so and it's, she's it's like overwhelming her senses, which would then show us that's why they can't not mate. Because once mm. they get in that state, they're almost insatiable. They have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then she like stalks Alice at the, the pool. That was funny. I mean, yeah. it was funny that she came back and was like that aggressive mm-hmm. towards her. And, and, and the, I assume she can't change unless she's had sex. Right. And she hadn't had sex. So she ran away. She comes back. Yeah. So I guess she was making all those noises as a human, which was still pretty cool, you know, because it sounded like there was a panther loose in the mm-hmm. room. Um, but yeah, and tore, shredded her clothes. So it makes you feel like she has some control over the powers. Yeah. Um, but the way he describes it is that you you turn into the cat, at, you know, with the sex stuff. Although, wasn't he already the cat when the prostitute showed up? Oh, yeah, he was. So who do you have sex with to do this? I wonder. Hmm, that's a good point. But she was late, so maybe somebody else had been there. Yeah. So, or maybe he had sex, 
and then came in as the cat. But the guy was like, their only way in here is through the front door and I would have caught it. So that's a little bit of, I guess, a loophole, but still very fun way to open it. How nonchalant the prostitute is about everything, you know, she's yeah. joking and, and, and giving them basically a, a price rundown. And the whole time there's a panther under the bed with its tail sticking out. And then she finally notices it when it starts whopping at her. And she just I, like kicks at the tail. Like I would have been yeah, gone. Right. Like, and she was so <laughs> nonchalant. About, I guess, you know, being a prostitute in, in New Orleans is probably. You see some things. Yeah. It's probably pretty scary. So uh, I thought that was a funny start. I thought it was cool that she got away. Yeah. You know, we got a good, um, you know, attack and it, and it helps lead the story so that the, the cat can get caught. Yeah, because um, then we get introduced to oh, or, why am I? They were all I, in order. Yeah, I just you know, here's the weird thing, right? So I go to look at like I always do IMDb, and I get the usually get the um, pictures from there. And a movie like this, which I, I it's got a great rating and it's popular. It has 99 pictures, and I want to say 80 of them are of the lady. And the movie yeah. poster. N- yeah. And Natasha this one too. really didn't have, there were so many pictures I thought they could have put in there, screenshots. Yeah. That I was surprised it was, this was the best shot of Ed Bagley Jr., who I'm like, I can't believe he's in this movie. Right. You know? And um, I mean, just every, every character, even all the John Larroquette's in this movie. Yeah. Um, it was, I, for like, I saw him and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I know. It's amazing, this cast. And I was like, oh, this would have been a fun, um, you know, I mean, these guys in a different, just to see the same cast in a couple different movies in that time period would have been really fun. Cause they, you know, again, they're so young. I want to say it was pre night court for Larry cat. And, uh, you know, he's just playing, a, just, what was it? Maybe five minutes. He's in yeah. the thing. If but, that, if. and, um, and it's like every single person you see, you're like, I know that person from something else. And so yeah. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, um, I liked how it was a really small cast. Of course, they yeah. had like extras and stuff, but the main cast was really small. And initially, though, you're like, oh, they're going to they're flooding us with these characters. They introduced the first three characters, then almost immediately they introduce us to like five more characters. But they their their part was so perfectly laid out that you don't get confused by anybody. Even when they pop back in, if they had a small part before, you know exactly where they are in the, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and so you're right. It's a, it's a small central cast, but all the moving pieces of the extras and the other people on the outside, even as they weave in and out, it doesn't take away from anything. It's a, it's a, a really well done movie in that aspect. Yeah. So we have uh, John Hurd, right? John Hurd, right? Yeah. yeah as Oliver, um, who was, was, I guess kind of in a thing with Alice, Annette O'Toole. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're in a relationship because, like, the right after he meets the main character, um, the night, I guess the day after he meets her, Alice is like walking up to kiss him and he's almost like shoving her off of him. Yeah. I thought, oh, this is very awkward. Yeah. I was waiting for more of a cat fight between Alice and I and, and Irina. Yeah. Is that what it is, Irina? Irina, yeah. And then Joe was. Kind of an, I don't want to call him an extra, but he, he was, was like, comedy relief. He was comedy relief. Yeah. Talking to the monkeys, singing songs and kind of filling in that? the blanks. So after that, so he first meets Irina, Alice shows up and he's with Joe and she gives him the kiss and then they're walking away and Oliver pulls a mouse, looks like a frozen mouse out of his yeah. pocket and gives it to Joe. Like, you're really walking around. He was wearing a suit. Like I could see if he was wearing like his. Yep. Cover it was like a his... snack for one of the cats. Yeah. And he just had <laughs> his dry uh, rodent in his pocket. It was funny. Yeah. But Joe, Joe played it perfectly. Um, so I. Poor Joe, man. Poor Joe. And this movie's almost two hours. And when yeah. I initially saw that, I thought, uh, I wonder that might be too long. But I think, I think it's actually the right length. This is a good movie. I don't know. I don't. I keep going yeah. back. It's like I'm arguing with myself in my head. But in turn, I did enjoy the movie. Uh, yeah. I, I I wouldn't have minded it being more howling, a little more horror, you know. But I think if they would have done that, it had to. It would have had to been an hour and a half. And I think they would have missed out on a lot of the the heart and the tragedy yeah. of the story. Then yeah, it just and... becomes a, a slasher kind of vibe to it. Yeah, I did like the. The scene where they had one scene where they showed Irina transforming, 
like not yeah. completely but like enough so that you know what's going on right and it totally gave me jeff goldblum in the fly vibes yeah it with did. her face <laughs> yeah the face was you know she, uh, the forehead started getting bigger and then her eyes get changed and her face starts kind of getting that and then they rip through the skin yeah to give us the the cat which the fake cat that they used looked pretty realistic most of the time and it seemed like a lot of the scenes they had a real cat going so yeah i, I uh tip my hat to all the people because there's a scene you know, when they're doing the dream sequence or he's visiting her after he dies where he's like – it looks like he's a few feet from the panther sitting up in the tree. And he's eyeballing that panther the whole time he's doing his lines. So yeah. you can tell that he's like a little nervous about the cat being there. Um, yeah, it it's awesome like they had – in that tree, I don't know. I think there was like probably like four or five yeah. panthers. And I'm like – I don't know. I would be nervous too. I don't care how many trainers or how to like tame they're supposed to be. Yeah. Especially because they kept riling them up in the other scenes. And so they're yeah. always snarling and, and, and swiping and attacking. Yeah. So, the uh, other the old- awesome scene that I loved was when Oliver was doing the autopsy on the leopard Paul or the Panther yeah. Paul. That was a pretty damn cool scene. I'm not I don't know why, like, his body completely disintegrated into goo. Well, I assume that's, like, the quote-unquote curse of the mm. the beast as it dies. Um, maybe because the human side of it got exposed. Yeah, I but, thought it was cool, though, when he's cutting open the belly of the of the, the panther, and then all of a sudden this arm flings out. I was like, holy crap, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and then it starts releasing that weird toxic gas, and then the whole thing yeah. just zips down. Um, yeah, no, the way they did it. I mean, the scares he puts in this movie really work. And and he's only got one jump scare that I thought was silly. When she, when Alice is running through the park and she thinks she's being followed. And then out of nowhere, a giant Anatolian shepherd, which is a hundred pound, like German shepherdy kind of dog, attacks her. Jumps up at her and then she pats its head and it drops down and walks away. Yeah. And I thought. Uh, that dog's either going to attack that lady or, you know, she, it, that's not a normal greeting. I don't think for that kind of a dog because no. there's no owner anywhere. So it's a loose dog. You would think that it's more of a, a you know, something wrong with it the way they had yeah. it, but it was 100% just there to make you think a Panther was chasing her. And then it was a jump scare kind of opportunity, but most of the other scares, they're all genuine yeah, and well done. And they use lighting really well in this movie. Uh, there's a lot of really cool in and out of darkness, out of shadows. Um, yeah, and I think the the best location for this movie was New Orleans. Oh, I yeah. Think. It, it had without – and, and I, I think it's just because that city seems to be so inter, intertwined with that kind of vibe, that erotica vibe, yeah. you know. It's exactly what I think of when I think of of that city. And you couldn't – I don't think you could have pulled that off in any – Los Angeles – would have been too commercial. New York would, I think, wouldn't have worked because it would have been too um, concrete, you know? Yeah, how do you hide a panther? Level. Yeah, in, perfect in, level of everything there. Yeah. Um, um, another thing that kind of irked me a little bit was Oliver was supposedly so in love with Irina that he would not kill her. And he basically just, you know, at the end... She's like, either kill me or let's have sex one last time, but tie me up, meaning she's going to turn into the panther. Um, And then he, like, brings her to the zoo and, like, keeps her around. But then he's, like, obviously in a relationship with Alice at the very end. Oh, yeah. She's she's rebounded back. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. She's she's taken him back. Yeah. She's forgiven him for that. And I, I would assume she understands that the Panther is. So, I mean, we see cat people too. It's just Alice being a dick to, to the Panther <laughs> for two hours. That'd be funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, how did he explain? He, oh, well, you know, that Panther that was here that got killed. Well, well now they, I have another Panther. <laughs> well, they, everybody, all the cops saw it on the, on the bridge when it jumped yep. over the thing. So they thought maybe uh, maybe he says that it's dead and they ordered a new one. But yeah, I mean, that's it's a small <laughs> ordered a new one, <laughs> small um, loophole, you know. And so we're like, yeah. well, it's it's forgivable 
for the others. Yeah. I mean, but you could almost get the you almost get the feel that the director, you know, who wrote the script is also working out all of these different taboos because you've got you know you've got incest you've got bestiality because you know he knows that she turns into a, a cat mm -hmm. um in a way and then you've got uh, at the end you've got the s m stuff you know tying her up and all that and the submission of her so it, it, in a way you could see that this and in 82 that's got to be pushing the envelope yeah. it feels like you'd see that on tv today but i i do remember cat people being one of the ones that my parents were like not like um jazzed about me seeing you know they would not have cared about me seeing a lot of the already movies that i did but i figure this would be one that stood out because yeah. it is just so overtly sexual and yeah. you know at that age uh, and that's i think the thing that our generation has is that weird um window into stuff that we weren't supposed to see that we just saw all the time and, mm -hmm. and maybe we don't understand what's going on, but it's it's imprinted on us. And then yeah. later on, you know, you find us all writing these stories that have all kind of aspects of different things that we may have seen at a way too young age. So, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, this is definitely way too young. And I um, do remember seeing parts of it, but I don't remember, like I said, seeing the whole thing. There was a couple of times last night when I watched it that I was like, oh, I don't. Yeah, this is uh, this is really cool, and I have no memory of this, so I must not have seen it. But um, man, that cat was so cool! Oh yeah, just a beautiful cat. Yeah the the cat that they were doing the autopsy on, of course, not the scenes where he was actually like cutting into the cat, but when he was moving the cat from the that gurney was... onto the autopsy, table, it looked like a real sedated yeah, I was, panther. I know. I kept thinking the same thing. I was like, wow, they really just sedated a panther and they're dragging it around. Yeah. I was kind of curious what they were going to do, how, how much we were going to see. And then they did up close shot. So you can tell that yeah. they're cutting through, you know, a fake cat, but the, yeah, no, I thought that was really interesting yeah. that they would do that. Cause I can't imagine that happening today. It'd have yeah. to be CGI or, or, or pre-made, you know? Yeah. But um, like, is that what they really did? Did they like just oh, sedate yeah. a panther and just like, oh, just put him here and then we're going to move him onto this table. Like how heavy that oh, yeah. cat that must cat, be. 800 pounds, maybe 600. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it has to be, it's all muscle thing yeah. was huge too, but yeah, no, isn't that how they, in the old, that's why they had to make the, uh, the, the division that controls animal abuse and stuff in movies. So I think they used to just run through horses and not really care about what happened to them. And they just put animals down and if things happen, they just happen. Nobody cared, yeah. you know, even yeah. with like the bugs and stuff. And you'd like read about creep show and all the roaches and they're supposed to make sure that none of them got damaged and hurt and stuff. And what did really? They <laughs> yeah. They, they were supposed to, they have a roach wrangler for that whole sequence of the, the, the guy that's like, um, was it Howard Hughes that, that's a clean freak or whatever. Oh yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Like crazy, the crazy billionaire or whatever. Yeah. And so yeah, they had like a cockroach wrangler, which I like, Ew. can you imagine that job? <laughs> I guess it just gives me the creeps, you know, I was yeah, like, no. I'm not a bug person. That's one thing I'm really not into. Yeah. Uh, they're cool, but I'm not going to be picking up a whole bunch of cockroaches or anything, you know, Joe's now, apartment must have squicked you out, man. Oh, I know Joe's that was, and that, that was, <laughs> just at the isn't that just at cgi ish you know so there's a couple because i yeah. think they had a few but most of it was stop motion and real roaches and i was like Ugh. yeah but it's funny though that movie's funny yeah so, um but no i would have loved though to have been able to hang out with the cats and i thought that was a cool part about this movie is all the actors that worked at the zoo probably got to hang out i mean they're hanging out with the elephants and getting to wash the elephants down yeah. and that one scene when they're bringing the elephants out to get in the pool or the lake or whatever it is. The I guess it was a pond or or whatever. There was one guy just sitting there smoking a cigarette. And I was yes. thinking that yeah. guy has to be the real animal wrangler or the yep. zoo employee. And he's just like, come on, let's go. And he's just sitting there. Because he's got the it. crop in one hand and a cigarette yeah. in the other. I thought, man, it, this <laughs> he's feels like, in the pool, realistic. in the pool. <laughs> this feels so realistic. And it was so funny watching that guy. Cause he you could tell he's like he could care less about being in a movie. He's just yeah. moving the elephants. Who cares? He's like, I'm just gonna do my job, man. I just want to do my job. <laughs> he made me laugh out loud. I thought the uh I thought it was cool when the kids bought the pack of um Empire Strikes Back cards. Yeah. That was really cool in the gift shop because I remember buying those cards 
You get that awful stick of gum and then the really cool movie cards. Yeah. And to hear 25 cents, I was like, oh, man, wouldn't that be cool to go back to those days where you 25 cents per pack of those uh, collectible cards and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, that was that was a fun little tie in. And I'm wondering, I, I assume that that Fox must have put cat people out, you know, yeah. or whoever. Yeah, Isn't it 20th Century Fox that did Star Wars? Yeah. So, um, you know, a nice little tie in because, I mean, Empire either was out or was coming out. I, I don't know when cat. I know cat people came out in eighty two. I just don't remember, you know when. Um, yeah. It wasn't April. One of those that was, it was yeah, April. Okay. So so then when did Empire come out? Empire had to be the summer movie, right? It had to have been like June, July. I would assume it was the big movie of that year. Um, the Empire Strikes Back actually came out in nineteen eighty. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that's even weirder. Yeah. yeah, because didn't Jedi come out in eighty two? Uh, Let's see. Nineteen eighty three for Jedi. Okay. That's a weird thing. So it was like what a couple years between the. We're gonna well maybe we need to do a whole Star Wars uh, podcast. I'm all about. on that. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> if any, so. if there's anything you want to know about the Mandalorian, I'm your girl. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited it, to see the movie. Yeah, me too. Not to, not to sabotage this, but I'm excited to see what they do as a full feature. Yeah. Um. But this is a great movie. Um, it, I don't think that, I would have appreciated it as a kid, but yeah. watching it now, I did enjoy it. I thought it was a well done movie. Yeah, and then the end, where you're just left like watching the panther in the cage, and you're like, "Poor Irina." And so, not only is she in a cage, but she can't be with the man she loves, and he's coming by to see her. You know, yeah, every day. So every day. And then he's smooching on April in front yeah. of him, probably. So yeah, and now right. here's a question though. What if they tried to mate the Panther with the Panther? Huh, Would that yeah. change it into something different? Would that continue the curse? That's the other thing that was kind of weird because at the beginning of the movie, like you said, they're sacrificing the women to yeah. the Panther God, and the Panther, you know, obviously has sex with them and then they have a baby. But later, Paul says that the children's souls were sacrificed to the Panthers. And, and grew they, inside yeah, the Panther. And then became the Panther children. So I'm like, well, that's different than the women yeah. having babies, I guess, because it says inside the Panther. So I'm like, I'm a little confused on the whole how they got these Panther people. But um but it's still it's still an intriguing idea, and it was a well done movie. And overall, I can see why it was success successful. And uh, I assume it was a it was a at least a moderate hit. Yeah. Um. I don't feel like this was like the thing. Uh, you know, the no. thing failed. I think this probably did well. It yeah. has that weird vibe of the early eighties. Those these kind of movies, um, they always seem to work, and they always yeah, seem and to draw a crowd. People and it had a naked Natasha Kinski. Oh, and yeah. when she wasn't naked, she was wearing shirts that you could clearly see through oh, with yeah, no bra. Yeah. <laughs> she's 100% into it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wasn't she like a model or just honestly, an actress? I don't remember. I, know, I don't know. I, she probably was, though. She, she seems like she has that um, pedigree, but she also, she's actually pretty good. You know, there, I mean, you obviously can tell that she's foreign. So there's a little bit of a, sometimes you'll get that little bit of a hiccup, you know, when they're acting in American stuff, not her, na not her native language or whatever. But overall, I thought she was really good. She handled uh, the whole sweeping arc in, in a believable fashion. At no point did you feel like she was just there because she's pretty. Yeah, um, and you, you, you really get that was a problem with '80s movies was uh, there were a lot of times that somebody with no talent would get would get um, you know thrown into a movie at the, as the star, and then you would kind of suffer through their performance while yeah. everyone around them, you know, holding them up. But yeah, she was she was great playing. I want to call it almost two separate roles. Oh yeah, you yeah. have the the first Irina, who's you know young like and. Naive, naive yeah. and then you've got the 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 sex kitten sex cat the you know she's gonna get her man and she's gonna go after the woman who is trying to get her man you know 
Yeah, I was going to try and see if they listed some of the movies she was in on this uh, on the Amazon page, but it just has her just her just says she was born in Germany um, in 61. But yeah, she's she was in movies like this in the oh, she no, I'm starting to mix her up with the other one with the lady that played April. She was uh, but she was in movies like this, some of them foreign, some of them stateside that kind of had this erotic feel to them in the early 80s, at least. And then she kind of branched off after that. Um, Annette O'Toole, who played April, she was in... Alice. Um, yeah, she was in a lot of cool stuff around this movie. So you could tell, this was like, it must have been when she was like her most popular arc. Because, I mean, it seemed like every year she was in a movie. I think she was, yeah. wasn't she in Superman 3? And, yeah, um, you know, just a lot of things that were blockbusters or, or thought to be, this was going to be a big movie. And she had a role in almost all of them. Um in the early 80s late 70s so um i assume she's peter o'toole's daughter her right. name's annette o'toole i think so but i could be totally wrong just feels like uh it feels like that would have been and i got it... shock when uh um you said that natasha kinski was born in 61 i was like holy crap that's what this <laughs> and... says Annette O'Toole was born in 52. Yeah, isn't that crazy? I mean, we're talking about a movie that was what? No, that's not, Peter O'Toole is not her father. How crazy is that? And definitely... actually, her her father's name is William West Toole. Oh, that's funny. So there's no O, so she must have so, added the O. Yo, I wonder. Add it in there, and then people are immediately just thinking, putting the connection there, because she would have been young enough to be her his daughter. Yeah, that's that's smart. You know, it's the opposite of like um, Estevez. You know, not not using yeah. Sheen or whatever. Yeah. So she uh, was in Superman three. She was in Forty Eight Hours. Yeah. She was in it. Oh yeah, yeah. She was the 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 adult, mm -hmm. right? The adult mm -hmm. version. Yeah. Um. Yeah, she's been in a lot of good stuff. She's a good. She's a good actress. I enjoyed yeah. uh, um, her part was, you know, kind of didn't have a ton in this movie, but yeah. I mean, she was kind of the romantic interest or the rival. She, uh, but she's also her friend. I mean, they went out for the drinks and the way they, they talked and they yeah. interacted. There wasn't any malice there. You didn't get any um, rivalry, even though we, we know that the, their relationship was, kind of upended because of this girl showing up yeah so she was very mature about the whole thing at least the character was um but then at the end she immediately flips it when she feels like the other character's menacing her yeah um, she, and i think you're right to... part two is just alice tormenting irena the panther yeah. <laughs> i think so and then you know what and i probably watched that too because i think it would be cool to see what was going on i yeah. i included uh detective brant here um he had a very small part, but without him, we wouldn't have known about the uh, the way that Paul was living in the basement trap yeah. with the chain allowed to eat people. So I guess he must have they must have brought women down there for him to mate with. And then when he changed, he would kill them in his hope of breaking the curse, I guess, maybe. Yeah. But it seems like he experimented for a while. Um, and then that lady, I got the. The sense that she's also from the circus, Vimal or whatever. Vimali, yeah, probably. I mean, maybe that's why she, because it sounded like she had been with Paul for like a long time, maybe yeah. even like when he was a child. So maybe she's the one that took him after their parents died. Yeah. The Frankie uh, Faison is the guy that played Detective Brandt. And when you see him, you're like, uh, oh, I definitely recognize him. He was in Silence of the Lambs, Manhunter, Hannibal. Oh, well, he was in all of the Hannibal Lecter films. That's listed here under his trivia. But he was in a whole bunch of shows. I mean, when you see him, he's like, I, he immediately, he was another like John Larroquette. I was like, oh, yeah. that's a big actor. I've seen that guy. Oh, it's a good actor, I should say. Maybe not yeah. big, but overall, great movie. Um, it didn't have as much of an imprint on my childhood or my whatever, but I do remember it. And I do remember bits and pieces that I probably caught as I was turning on the um, movie channel. Um, but it's definitely one I think people should check out and watch. And I yeah. think it would, and it fits into exactly what we're doing. This is one of those movies that, that you could see how it would lead 
to um, a love of horror and um, and a good a, a, a different subgenre of the horror. Right. You know, without this, you know, this kind of feels like a precursor to um, Hellraiser in a way, yep. just the erotica part of it, you know, yep. it's got the sexuality and stuff. And I could easily see um, that side of it kind of, of morphing into what we got with Frank and all that stuff in Hellraiser. Um, yeah. And a totally I was different like, thing, but I'm not, yeah. you know, but I'm just saying I could see how it leads us. This movie would came out. It's accepted. It was popular. They take a chance when they see what they want to do with Hellraiser a little bit more. Yeah. And, plus, and, the, and then he ups the gore, of course. Yeah. And another thing that was a uh, big for me was, you know, back then um, we had watched, you know, we had seen the werewolf movies, too, mm -hmm. you know, American werewolf in London howling, but this was something different. Like, because oh, yeah. back then all you knew of shapeshifters was werewolves. Yeah. You know, when you're that young, but then you're like, people can turn into Panthers. And that's amazing. Yeah, and to have the female character um, be able to do it, I don't. Re I mean, we had some, I guess, female werewolves in the Howling, but the majority of them seemed to be men. You know. Yeah. And so that was kind of a little twist mm -hmm. too. You know, that she was able to. Uh, I mean, of course, Paul is the main killer of as the Panther, but. You know, she she had a couple of situations where she killed things. Of yeah, course, she killed Gateman, the guy in the shack. Yeah, to get back into human form at the very end. But did they have sex the first time they were in that cabin and he's asleep on the couch and then she leaves? And then no. she Right. So they don't, but then she still ends up killing the rabbit, rabbit. or whatever. Yeah. So I started wondering if maybe does she have to kill a person to change back? Or could they just have like some goat there yeah. and then they could have been fine you know they could have sex and then she goes kills the goat and turns back but you know i don't know they didn't really give us an idea of killing an animal would be the equivalent yeah um, i don't think they were looking for loopholes i think they wanted to have the ending that they had which is a tragic ending which of course i always applaud yeah it's not a happy ending so yeah it's definitely not a happy ending yeah check it out if you haven't seen it it's a really great movie um one of my favorites one i remember like i said at the beginning what sticks in my mind is when the paul leopard is going crazy in the room after mm -hmm. he you know attacked the the prostitute so yeah definitely check it out yeah i definitely see it again i, I it's um it, it's uh i'm interested in seeing um the uh collector's edition because i i'm kind of like i'm curious i'd like to see the behind the scenes stuff and the, the special, special effects features. stuff and all that yeah. kind of stuff. I'd love to see all that. And uh, I was disappointed because I, that's the first thing I did when you and I discussed, we're going to watch this movie. I went to Amazon to order it. And I guess it must be either out of print or um, just out of stock at Amazon because I was going to have to order it from a third party and it wasn't going to get here until after we were going to record. So uh -huh. I ended up just running the episode, but um yeah, no, I'm still, I'm very interested into it. And so this, this felt like a, uh, it was a perfect movie. It was a perfect um, second showing to the thing. Yeah. And I wanted another 1982 movie. So I yeah. was like, man, I, I'd love to go back and just kind of look at that. And let's see what, what else came out that year. Yeah. Before. Let's just like watch all the horror movies that came out in 1982. It was a good year. <laughs> it's, it, so far, so far, so good. And uh, I, I, I want to say, didn't the Howling come out around this time too? So yeah, so maybe the Howling was another one that had this um, vibe to it. So, um, but yeah, no, it was a great movie, and we're going to continue this series, and then we're also doing we're going to get back to the books uh, as well. So. Yeah. Now it is time for our not Stephen King book of the week. Um, and the book I chose is actually one I just finished a few days ago. It's another, I have no idea where I came across this book. It is um, Price Manor, The House That Seeks by Mocha Pennington. It's actually number five in a series of books from Deadline Horror Collective. So there's four, I didn't know this until I started reading the book. So it's, 
five books. There's actually, from what I've read, I think there's more coming, but it's all the books are based around this house, Price Manor. They seem to be standalones because this book um, did not reference anything that happened in another book with the exception of mentioning one of the other author's names. Um, It was uh, probably meant to be like a funny joke thing, Um, but it's basically about this house. Um, This installment here, I don't want to call it a haunted house, um, but the house is, I'll say alive and it draws these people in um, certain people that it needs to sacrifice so that the house can take a human form. So it's really cool. There's Wendigos in it. There's ghosts. There's creatures. There's this weird house thing that just appears. So that's the basis for the whole series is this house, Price Manor, just appears in different time periods and different places. That's really Um, cool. Yeah, so the first book is written by Mike Salt. I'm sure you know the name. Uh-huh. Uh, another one is written by Jamie Stewart. And then I forget the other two authors' names because they're not names that I've I've known before. Um, but yeah, it's like this was such a good book. Are they all recent? Yeah, this one actually just released in October. Okay. So I must have like seen it on instagram probably and then like pre-ordered the ebook because i just remember scrolling through my library and i'm like oh that this looks interesting like yeah it does i like the cover it's really intriguing Um, in the the whole idea i mean it's kind of the same uh idea that that i did with don texas of not keeping it in the same timeline because it's i don't want to afford but this is perfect if you're going to have multi authors because then everybody can do whatever they want anytime they want to do it and not be um, tied down to a, a, a timeline. That's yeah. an awesome gift that yeah. that they gave to each author, but also opens up the door to so many fun things. Yeah. And is I this think, the first yeah. book you've ever read by, uh, by this author? Yes. This is actually her first book. Oh, okay. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm really interested because I think the one written by Jamie Stewart takes place in the 1800s. This one is modern. Um, there's like some social media influencers in there. Um, uh, one of the guys is. I forget what Kiernan does. Oh, um, they have a YouTube show. Kiernan and his friend Trevor, who is not alive in this book, he had like that's part of uh, Kiernan's like background. Um, Trevor had disappeared, assumed dead. Um, They had like a YouTube show. So this one's a modern time period. Then Jamie's um, Stewart's is in the 1800s. And I haven't looked into the others yet, but I'm like, I know I'm reading them. Yeah, no, it sounds very interesting. I like the fact that you can jump around and and read them however you want to. That's always nice too. Um, I like uh, when a series is a little open. Yeah. Especially if it's good. Yeah. So so this is a great book. If you like creepy, like I said, I don't really want to call it a haunted house, even though there's ghosts. Mm -hmm. Um, There's just so much going on that it's, it's really hard to describe, but it's really good. Um, And I can't wait to read more from this author because she's fantastic. It sounds awesome. (laughs) That's really cool too, that, that, um, you know, you don't normally see first time authors, getting to do a series that that's established. It seems like this might be, you know, they might've started uh, with some, some names and then opened it up for other folks, but yeah, uh, you don't normally see that. That's really cool. I think that's really cool too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, check it out. We'll have a link to it on Amazon um, down below. Give it a read. It's a great book. Awesome. All right. And we will see you all on the next episode. Take it easy.